You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. Each week, you'll hear from remarkable guests who have overcome challenges and obstacles to succeed in the face of adversity. By listening to their stories, you'll get practical tips, tools, and resources you can implement today to bust through your own internalized prisons of worry and doubt. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hey everyone, this is Sarah, your host, and I want to thank you so much for downloading this episode of the No Labels, No Limits podcast. As you know, this podcast is all about shedding limiting labels and beliefs so that basically we can shine our light out into the world. I personally believe without any doubt we're each capable of more than we can imagine. And that when we clarify, align, and declare our intentions for good, we can create a positive ripple effect in the world. And on that note, I want to just give you a little heads up about something in the fall. So if you describe yourself as someone or you have a feeling, this undeniable pull to kind of be a light or leave a legacy for good, and you want to join other brilliant women in your quest, just hop over to our website at sarahbox.com and leave me a message, or you can email me at sarah at sarahbox.com. Um, just a heads up, we'll keep you um, in the loop on everything going on with that. Now, I want to just jump on into today's podcast because this is going to be an interesting conversation. First of all, I really like our guest. I like what she's all about. I think her path is, um, has been and likely will continue to be um, intriguing and amazing and impactful. I think Michelle is someone who is leaving a legacy in the world for positive impact through her work. So let me tell you a little bit about Michelle, Michelle Claire. Michelle is a certified medium. She is an angel intuitive, a spiritual coach, an energetic healer, an intuitive life coach, and a three-time near-death experience survivor. We're going to get into all of that um, in our in our discussion today. Um, but Michelle receives messages from loved ones who've already crossed over, as well as angels and life guides. So we'll find out what are the difference between angels and life guides. As a certified evidential medium, and we're going to ask Michelle to define that for us, um, Michelle regularly works with the Helping Parents Heal organization, and she has been a guest on numerous podcasts, including this one, um, and one called A Matter of Life and Death with Arizona Bell. And if that wasn't enough, Michelle has been featured in Craig McMahon's documentaries, Life to Afterlife, I Died, Now What?, and another soon to be released called Life to Afterlife, Death and Back, Chapter 3. But wait, there's more. Michelle is now in negotiations with Netflix for an upcoming documentary. So with all of that as a prelude, let's welcome our guest, Michelle Claire. Michelle, thank you so much for being on the podcast and welcome. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you here. I have lots of questions, as you can imagine. Um, But I do like to start by asking all of our guests if there is something they do every day that keeps them focused on who they are, what they're doing in the world, and staying on track. Absolutely. And for me, every day when I wake up, I pose a question to God, source, the divine, and I say, good morning, God, what do I need to know today? And I go from there. And some days the answer is so simple. It's Michelle, just live. Michelle, stop and smell the roses or do your best or your third reading coming up today is going to be a challenge. Show up with all your heart. Um, So it just depends. But every morning, I feel like if I check in with source, it puts me on the right path. Now, have you always done that, Michelle? No, it's a habit that I have started or a a practice that I have done for the last year and a half. 
Okay. And it's and it has been life changing for me because I realize that there's such a higher power guiding us every day. And so by that being the first thing I say in the morning, it gives me a direction beyond the human part of myself. How do you get your answers? I listen. And sometimes they come in words. Sometimes they come in feelings. Um, it just kind of depends on the day and the way I'm getting it. And some days I will, I will say that and I will feel peace. And I'm like, okay, today's the day that I'm supposed to look for peace. Peace in the five minutes drinking my iced tea, peace in the sunshine for five minutes. But I will just know, um, and I think we all have this ability, we don't need to make it more complicated than it is. Absolutely. I'm on a quest for making everything have as much ease as possible. And I love that because I truly believe that God sourced the universe will meet us where we are. So if we say it's going to take three hours for me to meditate and find peace, the universe says, okay, well, we can wait three hours. <laughs> and if you say, I have three minutes, please help me find peace. They say, okay, here you go. <laughs> Ta-da. Ta here you are. I love it. Okay. So let's, let's just do a, a little bit of definition so that we're all on the same page. First of all, can you tell me and our listeners, what is an evidentiary medium? Yes. So with that, I actually did testing. I did five blind Skype readings. So basically I was told log on at Wednesday at 11 o'clock and my screen was black. So I had no idea who I was meeting, where in the world, male, female, or anything like that. And I would start reading for them. And I would say, I have a younger male here. He's about this age. His name starts with a B and go through. And basically these people grade you or, um, on your performance and you get, you know, extra bonus points if you get a name or you or something like that. And so you to become certified, I had to pass five of those um, with with really good numbers. And I was able to do that. And then the evidential part is when you go to a medium, they need to be able to give you something specific. So not just generic. Oh, your mom really loves you. Your mom enjoyed watching you grow up. I mean, yes, that's probably true for most people, but they need to be able to get deeper into something that not everyone in the whole world would know or could generalize. So let's dive in a little bit to your story, right? Mm -hmm. So what is it like to experience a near-death experience, and let alone three of them? Mm -hmm. um, it's very much an awakening for you because I will tell you, I don't think you can experience that and come back the same. You just can't. But there's so much comfort in it because I know how much love and unconditional love and acceptance surrounds each of us. And in our humanness, we don't see that. But being able to go to these these amazing places and experiences and feel that completeness and be in a place where literally every molecule, whether it's the air, the wall, the sand, the beach, whatever this is, is literally radiating light and love. It's absolutely life changing. So walk us through, if you can, um, your first experience. What what happened? Yeah. So I was in the hospital. This happened in April 2000. I was in the hospital that day visiting my sister-in-law because she had just had a baby. And all of a sudden I had a massive seizure and I had never had one before and I have never had one since. But what I remember is waking up, opening my eyes and my grandma had transitioned. I use the word transition for died because as a medium, I will tell you, there's no such thing as death. There's life and life and just life. Um, so I, I opened my eyes and I'm laying with my head in her lap and I look up at her and she is the youngest, healthiest version of herself that I could imagine. And I'm looking at this room that we're in and the walls are all white and they are alive. And it's almost as if they're breathing and they seem solid, but they're alive. They're radiating this light. Um, I want to say it's the light of God or the light of the universe. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at her and I'm feeling unconditional love and acceptance and completeness beyond anything I've ever felt in my human body. And I look up next to her and I see this stunning angel, which was probably 12 to 14 feet tall. I was a little bit shocked at how big it was. Um, 
And I remember looking at it and expecting it to have feather wings. And what I realized was its wings were actually light and they were kind of iridescent. And they reminded me of the Aurora Borealis because they kind of flowed effortlessly and they almost seemed to span eternity all at the same time. And as I was looking at her in my head, I thought, what is your name? And she answered me. And I was like, oh my gosh, she can, she can hear what I'm thinking. So I wasn't aware of that telepathic communication, which was happening. And she told me her name was Madeline and that she was one of my guardian angels. And I was just kind of sitting there in awe, experiencing this in no hurry to leave, soaking it all in. And the next thing I know, I hear that them yelling, code, code, code. And I was back in my body because I had quit breathing during the seizure. What was your immediate or your or the first thought you can remember rec- after you recognized you were back in your body? Yeah. Well, the first thing I remember is that hurt. My head hurt. I was just like, I went from feeling amazing to, oh, it hurts. And my body felt so heavy. Um, I'm five feet tall. I'm not that big of a person. One arm felt like it weighed 500 pounds just to lift my arm. So I went from this place of lightness and no weight to feeling like, oh my gosh, my arm is so heavy. I I don't even think I can lift it. That's a shocker. Yeah, it was a shocker. It was. And, but what I was able to do was to take with me, which was beautiful, that feeling of being so completely loved and whole, which I truly had never or have any memory of feeling in my human life. And I was able to bring that in. And I came back and I just was like, oh, I'm so loved. Like not in an arrogant way, but just almost an excited, like I'm so loved. Like you don't know how loved we are. I wanted to share that. We are so loved. We have no idea. So when you start, so did you immediately start sharing that message? I guess there's that whole thing like you could have, but you may have been kind of reluctant to. Did you immediately share what had happened to you? I didn't. I would say it took me probably a couple weeks to tell my mom. I mean, I had a really bad concussion and I had had the seizure. So my brain wasn't quite wired um, the way it normally was. Um, but it took me a couple of weeks to tell my mom. And when I told her, I remember her looking at me, just she believed me, but it was almost she couldn't fathom it. It was almost a little bit too much. But she didn't say you were crazy. She did not say I was crazy. I think she was just trying to understand how that happened or what did I really what did I see or when my brain was going haywire during a seizure, how could I have such clear memories yeah. and know what I know? So, she was also an RN. So she was always thinking medically, mm-hmm. scientifically, and she really wanted that connection to things. The science connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's our logic. Right. You know, it's like, well, shouldn't there be cause and effect? Yeah. Right. If this happened, that would happen. So then one near death experience wasn't enough. You've had two others. Right. Right. And so, (laughs) you know, some people like to learn the hard way, I guess. And (laughs) maybe that's me a little bit. The second one happened again in May 2006. So this was after I had had my third child, my my son, I was having complications and he was born April 1st. So I was in and out of the hospital for the majority of six weeks. They would put me in, put me on IV antibiotics. I'd come home. They'd think I was better two days later back in the hospital. So it was a really rough six weeks. And the doctor said, we need to do a DNC. I think we, you have an infection in your uterus or you have a piece of placenta or there's something not right. And the night before I had this feeling, oh, I don't think I should do this. Like I really had that feeling and we all know that. But they were telling me it's a 45 minute outpatient procedure. You'll be okay afterwards. You can live your life. And I was so tired of being sick. So I said, okay. I go in. I talk to them once again. The doctor, the anesthesiologist, piece of cake. You'll be home soon. Okay. So we go in. And as I'm in there, what all of a sudden happens to me when I'm under anesthesia, and I've had other surgeries, but I never have any memories under anesthesia. But I'm laying there on the gurney in the operating room. And I see my beautiful white German shepherd named Tahoe, who had passed a couple of years before that, walk in, lay her head on the gurney and look at me. And this was something she did all the time in life. At night, we would laugh. We'd say she's making a round. She'd just check on everybody and then go back and lay down. 
the next thing I know, she and I are gone. We are no longer in this operating room. We are on this phenomenal beach running on the sand. And once again, the water's alive, the plants are alive, the air is alive, the trees alive. There's unconditional love, completeness, wholeness. And as we're running on the sand, I notice I'm like, it actually feels like we're running on clouds. It's not hard like it would be running on sand. And and I'm looking at her and she's radiant and beautiful. And we're having te telepathic communication. I know she's so happy that I'm there. She's so happy to see me. And we're just running and running. And I notice, gosh, I'm not getting tired, I'm not getting hot, I'm not getting thirsty. This is really interesting. <laughs> And then the other thing that's really funny about that is I personally hate to run. So who would ever think like an NDE, your near death experience, you're running. I literally have told my neighbors before, if you ever see me running, call 911 because that's not me going out for a jog. There's an emergency. There's an emergency. <laughs> so here I am running with my beautiful dog on this amazing beach. And as this part of me, so here's the thing, when we get to our souls, we're not like our human bodies where we're anchored in one place at one time. We can be having multiple experiences at once. So there's this part of my soul that is running on the beach with her in this place of contentment and love. There's this other part of me that can feel my six-week-old son scared because energetically his soul knows I'm leaving. And I'm able to go to him on this soul level and I say, I will find a way to stay. And at that point, I start to for pray, I guess. And I start to say, I need help. I, I can't leave now. I need to stay. And I can feel the operating room light up with light, a holy light coming in. Um, I can feel Jesus nearby. I can feel what people call the Christ consciousness of light and, and energy and healing. And then the next thing I know, I'm waking up in the post-op. And it's been three and a half hours since my surgery started. And I, so I knew something had gone wrong, but I didn't know what. Well, apparently the doctor had ruptured my uterus in one place and missed my aorta by less than a millimeter. They couldn't even stitch it. They had a packet. And then while they had called in the emergency laparoscopic surgeon, the doctor had ruptured my uterus in a second place. So you and, truly were crashing. Yeah. So it's interesting to me because you were communicating with your six-week-old son right mm -hmm. and this is a little different than about you but i'm is it because he was still open to that like here he is six weeks but you're having clear communication with him so is that because his consciousness is still connected more highly i guess would be my language i don't know that yes. that is accurate absolutely and here is the other thing with that so as a medium when i'm working with people maybe someone's had a one or two year old child that's transitioned and they come in and i can communicate with them on an adult level they're not babbling and making <laughs> baby noises because if we think about it our soul is always whole and it's huge and it's so much bigger than our humanness right and so at six weeks old yes think also too how energetically we were still connected because he had lived in my body for the last you know nine months so there was this really strong soul energetic connection and we were able to communicate in that way so briefly tell us about your third one but that i'm guessing that successively each of these led you into what you're doing today absolutely absolutely i felt like i always had the gift a little bit from the time that i was 12. my grandfather passed away and i could tell he was communicating with me and i'd tell my mom what he was saying and she says well you know i know you think grandpa would say that if he was still here and so i just kind of learned like oh okay me me and grandpa we're just going to have our own private conversation you know and and let that go and so then the next one that happened which for those people who love numbers here's some numbers for you it happened on 11 1 11. And by this time, my youngest was five years old. And then I had an eight-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old daughter. And I have 14-foot ceilings in my house. And so up about 12 feet, I have the candles that you put the battery in. And every night they turn on and they give you this warm, homey glow. And so my younger two were home. And I said, okay, I'm going to change the batteries. And then we're going to school to pick up your sister. So I get out the ladder. This is something I've done 25 times, never thought about it, climbing up the ladder. And I feel it start to move and I go, oh, and I know, I think to myself, I literally know this is going to hurt. And as I'm up there, I'm about 10 feet off the ground. I feel myself 
get ripped out of my body. Not in a painful way, but so fast, like a bungee cord fast, right? Just woo, and I'm out. And I'm standing with three people that I don't know. I know I don't recognize them, but yet I feel like I've known them my whole life. They feel like family. They feel like they know my deepest parts, you know, and, and I'm standing there and now I'm facing my body and the ladder and I can see my body and the ladder are suspended in the air. And these three beautiful people, two males and one female say to me, well, what would you like to do? Well, do you want to stay or do you want to go? <laughs> and as they're asking me this, I see this stunning angel, beautiful, stunning angel come in, not Natalie, a different angel. And I know that this angel is there to follow through with my choice of staying or going. And I don't know what that's going to look like. And I'm kind of sitting here and I'm thinking, well, this is amazing. Because once again, here I am in a place with no time. I feel complete. I feel so loved. I'm watching my body and I'm thinking, how do I have forever to make the decision of what I want to do? It should hit the floor in a second, you know? <laughs> and I'm literally just going through this humanness in my mind, right? About, wow, this is amazing. And there I am. And here's an angel and kind of soaking it all in. And and then they say to me again, what do you want to do? And I realize that I can see my two kids in the kitchen and I know that I cannot leave them. And then at that moment, it's as if I get a download of many things. And some of those things, I even don't believe I remember to this day, but I believe it was, okay, you get to stay, but we expect more from you now. There's more for your life plan, more for your purpose. You can't ignore us. You can't pretend you can't do this. Let's like, this is real. You got, you go back, but make the most of going back. And so the next thing I know, I was in my body and the ladder had fallen. I had hit the back of my head on the corner of my granite kitchen island and I missed my brainstem by half an inch. The angel moved my head a half an inch to keep me here. So I had a five and a half inch skull fracture, a brain bleed. I lost my taste, my smell, part of my hearing, my equilibrium. It was a little bit of a hot mess, to be honest with you, for quite a while. Um, but that time I came back and the interesting thing was I had lost so many of my senses and I felt like I had so much work to do to recover. And yet I came back with an unbelievable sense of gratitude because I felt like everything I had lost, it was okay because I was going to live to raise my kids and I was going to bring in more purpose into my life. Wow. Okay. Let's talk about your work as a medium. So um, when you decided to do that, did you just announce to everybody that I'm going to go and do this? Um, how did you start doing that? Okay. Um, being That's your fabulous mom self. <laughs> right. It was really hard because my friends, they were worried about potty training and first grade math. And, and I was like, I'm talking to dead people now. <laughs> so it was a little bit of a shift. And, and there was this part where I didn't, I was kind of scared of it at first because I didn't know it wasn't the me that everyone knew. But I will tell you what made me step into it was my son was five when I had my head injury and we believed he had tried to call 911 and that his call didn't go through. So we just figured he was scared. Maybe he dialed 991. We didn't know. At the end of January, 2012, my grandfather who passed away when I was 12 years old came through to me and he said, Michelle, he talked to me about my head injury. He talked to me about the whole accident. He talked to me about my son who never walked this earth with him. And he said, you know, he's really good with electronics. There's something on the 911 recording you need to know. And I said, well, I had never even thought of that. I don't even think I knew you could get your 911 recording. So I, I ordered it. It took a couple of weeks. It came in. And my son had been feeling really depressed because he said, mom, my call didn't go through. I didn't do anything to help you. Sophie, his sister, who was eight, she, she called 911. She could have done it without me. And we would say, Josh, you, you opened the door for the policeman. You, you made a difference. You helped. And we just could not, could not move him through that. I did not have the words. And so I ordered this recording because my grandpa told me to. And when I got it, the call came in and it says, 911, what's your emergency? And he says in his little broken voice, Sophie, what do I say? And then he laid the phone down. So I think he called the moment it happened and the trauma was so real, he literally forgot he called. So for the next minute and a half, they try to get his attention and my daughter's. And then you hear him say, I'm going to go push the house alarm button because we had a panic button on it. And she says, hold on, let me try calling 911. 
She hangs up the phone and her call goes through. So both of them had successfully called. When this little guy, five years old, came home from kindergarten that day, I said, Josh, your 911 call went through. It was like I lifted a 10,000 pound weight off mm-hmm. his shoulder. And you saw his self-worth come in. And he was like, I did do something to help you. I did make a difference. So at that moment, I could no longer just deny this gift of mediumship and the power it has to change people's lives and to bring them peace in whatever it is, even if it's just the fact that they need to know their loved one's okay, or that the last fight they had has been forgiven or whatever this is. And so because of that gift that I personally received, I knew I'm like, I've got to do this. I can no longer not do this. And then I would have visits from other people. I had a friend whose husband had um, transitioned by suicide come in and give me a message for her. And, And so I just realized, okay, this is part of my journey and I have to embrace it. So that's interesting. So your friend's husband came in, but you hadn't specifically intended to reach him, correct? Correct. So when I first really opened up after that head injury, I felt like they could just come to me. And sometimes the information came in so fast. It was like they just imprinted on you and you're like, oh my gosh. So I, so I was, so then what I did was after I had a few of those visits, I said, okay, I need to find someone who can mentor me and help me understand because there was part of me that didn't feel like I could do it as I call on demand. Like I felt like they could come to me, but I didn't know how to reach out to them or, and so I, so I mentored with different people for probably four or five years. And then I took a year and I practiced on everyone I could. I said, send me your friends, send me your friends, friends. Like just, I wanted to make sure I was getting the information. I don't want to know you don't tell me anything. Just let me see what I get. And then I was like, okay, about five, six years later, okay, I've got this. I can do this professionally. And I felt like that was what I was called to do. Did you get any pushback from people that you otherwise would have expected to be like in your corner and your champions? I did. It was hard on some of the people around me. Um, Probably lost some friends over it and it strained some relationships because I came back a different person. Like that hadn't been what I was doing in my life. I was a stay-at-home mom. And, And so then you realize there are people in your life that will love you for who you were five or 10 years ago, but can't really love you for who you are today. And it doesn't make them a bad person. It just means you've grown in a way that you can't go back. And so, yeah, that was hard. Yeah, I would imagine. And I know that that can be really tough for anybody who's pursuing something where it takes them out of their um, usual role, Mm -hmm. right? Or people come to depend on them and to show up in a certain way, and then they're not there. So there's a loss of that image of who that person is or was. Um, What's one of the most impactful things you've learn through your helping other people. So, I mean, clearly you've learned a lot about yourself and God and the love that's there, but when you've helped somebody, is there something that's just like, you go, wow, I had no idea. Yeah. I will tell you one of the things when I first started doing mediumship that I was worried about is like, well, what if somebody comes to see me and their people aren't there, (laughs) right? Their loved ones in spirit. What if there are no angels and no life guides? And here's one thing I have found that is so impactful. We feel very often like we are living this life alone, but what we don't realize is we have what I call our spirit team around us every second of the day. Your loved ones, your angels, your life guides. We have so much love and support to complete our mission of this life and the things we want to do and and experience it. And so to me, that's been very impactful because I've actually come to the point where, where people will tell me they'll be like, but especially going through COVID, but you know, my mom died alone in the hospital. No. No, we don't live this life alone and we will never die this life alone. That's not how this works. And so being able to tap into the fact that there is so much more than our human existence is very life changing. And then, you know, yesterday I had an amazing reading with a man who had a heart transplant and I've never had this happen before, but the donor came through. The donor came through. He was around 43 years old, a male with a name that started with a B. And he said, you know, I wasn't ready to go, but I want to let you know that I'm happy that you are using my heart and living your life in a good way. And I was just like, wow, 
because I hadn't seen that before. But so let's talk about that on this universal level. This man did not know this other man in, in life, but yet in this oneness and this consciousness, he's aware that this man gets to live longer because he borrowed my heart for a while. And it was just so beautiful and such a gift to be able to be a small part of that. Yeah, I would think it, it would be extremely special to be in that conversation, right? Mm -hmm. In that awareness of it. Yes. Um, does it feel, so when you're doing, a, you, you say you do a reading or you do a medium event or what, if say I'm your client, mm -hmm. what are we doing? Are we doing a reading? Yeah, we're okay, doing good. a reading. <laughs> okay, I just want to use the lingo that you would use. So um, are you hearing? Or are you sensing? Are you getting visual? How, how are you getting your information? Yeah, typically? most. Yeah, exactly. So in a regular, a typical reading, um, a lot of times people show up with their list of people they want to hear from, and that's fine. But I tend to get information from your loved ones, angels, life guides, and some psychic information. Because you you work with this team, whether we're aware of it or not. So that doesn't mean your number one person you want to hear from isn't going to do the most talking. But there's always so much more going around us. So in a typical reading, they'll come in, and I'll, and I will just connect. And I'll say, okay, let's see. It's a little bit like a radio in the sense where if you came in and you say, I really want to talk to my mom, then I'm like, okay, I'm tuning to mom channel 100.1, right? Oh, I want to talk to my angels. Okay, I'm tuning, tuning to channel 111. Um, and so that's kind of the way that energy works. It's always there. It's always on. It's always open. Um, but there is a tuning that I kind of do to get to where I'm going. I want to ask you about... Um... I have a different question, but before I ask you that, is there a difference between life guide and angel? What, what do you mean when you say that? Yeah. So from my experience, the angels really come in to guard us and protect us. And I knew in that third death experience that that angel was beautiful. And if I was going home to heaven, it was taking me straight there. And if I was going to stay, it was going to make that happen. And so I feel like they are our helpers. Um, I, I, this isn't maybe the right term, but it's almost like they work with us. Um, and, you know, and we've all had that. We've had the near miss car accident. We've had, you know, where you're like, oh, I shouldn't be here. You wouldn't guess what just happened to me. So there's this protection that comes with the angels. With the life guides, they really come to help us plan our lives and achieve our mission. And so they're the ones that I feel like are constantly giving us opportunities. Um, you didn't take that job. Okay, but look, they're calling you back or whatever this is, right? That that friend that you, you know, you just need to reach out and then you reach out and they say, hey, I was thinking about you. I have this phenomenal opportunity that might change your life. And and so the life guides really come as um, planning to keep us on the blueprint of the life that we want to live. And the angels truly come in as guardians, protection, and love. So the blue, I love that you said the blueprint of the life we want to live. Do we create that blueprint or does source and God create that blueprint? I believe it's both. I don't think it's either or. I think we pre-plan our lives. But then here's the tricky part. We come to earth where we have free will. So a lot of people self-sabotage regularly, right? Um, but I do believe that we come here and we have a plan with God, with our life guides, with our soul, where we say, you know, I want to achieve this in this lifetime. I want to bring more light to planet earth. I want to help more people. I want to raise the vibration, whatever this is. Or maybe you say, you know what? This time I want my life to be simple and I just want to be, you know, in this family and live on a farm and whatever this is. And, and so I do believe there is pre-planning that consists of our soul and of a higher source because I have no doubt, no doubt there is a higher source after three near death experiences that you, you, you know, I, I just, I have no doubt. And so there's a combination of our soul and source and what we plan and how we plan to use that. So you mentioned that, you know, we can self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. Why do we do that? Because we get in our, our humanness gets in our way. So I do believe there's a part of us that comes here with a certain percent of amnesia, right? Because if we knew where we were coming from and the love and the completeness and the wholeness, we would be like, you know, that's what people say. If I had a choice, why would I choose this? Why would I choose this life? Here's kind of the thing that I've talked to you about my son years ago when he was younger. Um, so think about 
this life, okay, as almost like a video game. So my son would be in there on his Xbox. He's got his headphones on. He's talking to his friends all over town, screaming, yelling, watch out for the sniper. Oh my gosh, you know, whatever. Like it literally sounds like they're in some kind of battle and their lives are being threatened. And I know he's safely sitting in the playroom or the game room. And then his character dies, you know, and, and he gets up and here he is the whole time. He's sitting there in his comfortable chair. He's got his drink. He's in air conditioning. He's fine. He gets up and he's like, oh, wow. Huh. Well, that was a tough game, but I learned. Or, hey, that was a great game, right? There's this part where our soul is in this place that is beautiful, wonderful, safe, air conditioned, all of these things that we need. And we decide to play this game of life. And we say, you know what? You're going to be on my team and you're going to be my friend and we're going to do this together. And so we come in to learn and grow because there's a growth that happens on planet Earth that cannot happen when everything is perfect and fine. And so our soul knows too that in the scope of eternity, this 100 year life is the blink of an eye. And so it's like, hey, let's go in for five minutes. Okay, see you there, you know? And that's what it feels like. And so part of it is we often forget that our souls truly come to play in the magic of life. And we get bogged down by the humanness. But I would say everything is spiritual because it truly is our soul having this, a, an experience. So it's all spiritual. And that's why when people will come to me and say, I got this sign from my loved one or this or that, I'll say it comes in layers because what's happening to you is also happening on your human layer, on your soul layer, and you're here to learn and grow. And we forget, so we self-sabotage because we buy into the humanness so strongly that we forget that we're all actually really powerful soul creators. So if someone wanted to connect with that part of themselves better, mm -hmm. or yeah, I, I'd say better. If it's there, it's, it's there. And it's just this thing of either ignoring it or not tuning in. Mm -hmm. um, how would you suggest they do that? Would it be like you're saying your morning practice of getting up and asking God? Or um, is there something simple someone could do so that they could start hearing that yes. part or attuning? Yeah. And once again, it will be as simple or as complicated as you want to make it. So if you think it's going to take the rest of your life, the universe says, OK, we'll wait, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, yes, so it's really simple things. For some people, it's journaling. Maybe it's just writing down a sentence or a paragraph every day. For other people, meditation works. But I will say we all meditate, whether you realize it or not. So for some people, that meditation is sitting there quietly. For others, it's driving. For others, it's going for a run. For other people, it's the hot shower or whatever this is. But we always have this ability to connect a source throughout our day. So taking those moments just to check in and ask for inspiration and guidance, here's the thing, you've got to do it with a little bit of a blank slate so that you can hear the answer. If you do it with, but I really want this to happen, then we might not hear the answer because you're so focused on, I really want this to happen. So finding where is that blank slate for you that you can ask the question or ask for the guidance and then receive it. So um, that's beautiful. And I, that whole trusting in what you get is the next obstacle I think people might come up with. I mean, think about when you said, send me all the people you know, right? I got to make sure I'm, I'm getting this. So say someone is um, getting in the practice of listening without expectation with their blank slate, and then all of a sudden start getting glimpses. Mm -hmm. How do they come to trust that? Do they have to test it? So I'm going thinking about your mom and her scientific nursing right. approach, right? Do they need to do a test or is it enough just to go, okay, I'm going with that? Yeah. You know, I always say take the path of least resistance. And that's probably saying I'm going with that. Right. Um, because I don't think that life was supposed to be hard. I don't think that. And so I think it's okay to take the path of least resistance when you're offered that. Right. That's not always going to be our opportunity in life. I would say this too, because people are logical. Yes, right. We want to know that that message I got came from my angel and this is what they mean and give me a date, a time and a signature. <laughs> you know, we want that. Yes, but spirit doesn't always work the way humans work. So you have to be open to it being a little bit different. But I would tell you this. I believe every person has had a spiritual quote experience in their life, if not many, many, many. There's no way you haven't. You're a spirit. 
You're a spirit in a body. So those whispers of like, even you look at your child or your dog and you say, oh, they look like they're not feeling good. And then a half hour later, they throw up and you're like, oh, you're right on it, right? That's your intuition and that's your knowing. And you didn't need, you yes, you got the feedback. You were right. They didn't feel good. They threw up a half hour later, right? <laughs> but had you interceded a half hour sooner, you might not be cleaning up the mess. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> You know, sometimes when things go on, I'm going, okay, how many times am I not going to listen to that before I get that? I only need to hear it once. Yes. And yesterday, for example, my 20 year old daughter was out and had to do all run errands, do different things. Everywhere she went, she's like, mom, that took me an extra 20 minutes to pick up prescriptions and 20 extra 20. No one else in the fast food line. And it took 20 minutes for me to get my order. You know, and he said, well, honey, I love you. And I think this is about you. Maybe this is you need to slow down a little bit or look at what is it? <laughs> because no one else in the world had like an extra two hours on what should have taken a half hour to get it done. So this is clearly about you. <laughs> what could you take away from this, honey? Yeah. So. I know I, that's um, I think it helps to have a little bit of humor sometimes when we keep looking at the same stub toe. Right. It's yes. like, I guess I could have moved that coffee table. Right. You know? Yeah. And How many like, times are you going to kick it before you should you decide to move it? <laughs> well, I will. I do want to know, do you find like have you done any work with people as they're transitioning? Has have family members asked you to come in and be present uh, during stuff like that? Times like that? Yeah. So I was, um, I was with my mom when she was transitioning from breast cancer and, um, not necessarily trying to be a medium, um, just being with my mom, being a daughter with her mom. And, and what I realized is my mom would sit up and she'd say, Oh, hi, it's, it's so good to see you again. And I wasn't seeing anyone with my eyes there, but I knew there were these souls coming through and she was reconnecting and I could feel this room was, was full. And, and so it was very comforting because I knew she was already connected and loved on the other side and they were just waiting with her. And I will tell you, I had an amazing experience. So there's also something called shared death experiences. And this is when we are either sitting with our loved one who is transitioning or and we see maybe their soul leave their body or the curtains blow or something, a little sign all the way up to people have reported seeing their loved one's life review. And so I was with my beautiful dog as we had a euthanizer and we did it at our house. And I was just laying on the floor in my pajamas, sobbing, nothing about me trying to be a medium. I was being very, very human in the moment. The vet administered the drugs and I was hugging her and I felt her soul so gently disconnect from her body. It was just like a feather on a breeze. And then I heard my mom say, I have her now. And about 30 seconds later, the vet listened to her heart and said, she's gone. But I had already known she had left. And so that was amazing to me to know that uh, it opened me up in a lot of ways because sometimes people's loved ones transition in a very traumatic way or it seems very traumatic, but it doesn't mean it was traumatic for their soul. Their soul could have just been that feather on the breeze and gently gone home, surrounded in love and light. So, so I think it's really interesting um, the things we come here to learn and to know that we are always going home to love. That's a very reassuring thing to know, you know, and I know that when my mom was dying, mm -hmm. um, our family was coming from different places. She died at home at her home with my other sister who was living with her, but we were my other one other sister and I were sitting in the room with her and she, you know, she was having trouble breathing because um, mm -hmm. that was part of her illness. And, but we were just kind of holding hands. And so we weren't talking because it would make her cough. But then all of a sudden there was this weird, like energy passed between us. And my other sister is on the other side of the bed, looked at me and she said, what just happened? Right. Cause I could feel it. And wow. I but I thought, well, how do I explain this? I said, all I can tell you is this isn't the first time we've said goodbye. Yeah. And um, but it was like totally calming. My mom said, mm -hmm. we've done this before. It's all good. Right. Yeah. And I just went, oh, and I got chills. But she had been the same thing as your mom. Like we were sitting there. She's my dad was there talking to her and there was total peace, you right. know, and about then we all went on a little drive. And then she passed while we were gone. I knew she wasn't going to go with her kids in the house. I know. 
I'm thinking, no. So my oldest sister was home, but nope. She waited till we were out of the house and that she talked to her last child on the phone. But it was pretty powerful, Michelle. And I, um, I just thought, wow, what a gift. Mm-hmm. What a gift. So anyway, with that, um, let's talk about people actually reaching out to you. So if people have never worked with a medium before, Mm -hmm. um, what can they expect? And I know that maybe different people have different styles, but tell us a little bit about what you might expect when they reach out to you. Yeah. So um, basically kind of what we've talked about, I connect with your whole spirit team during a reading. There's nothing scary that happens. It's not people will say, oh, I'm nervous. Okay. But it, but you don't need to be because it's not going to be scary. I am somebody who gets messages every day. My, my motto is that I will get information in light and love and for this person's highest good. And so knowing that, I know that whatever you need to know is going to come in light and love and for your highest good. And, and there's this part where if you open up to the peace it can bring you and knowing that you're not living this life alone, that knowing your mom is still connected to you or your loved one is still connected to you, it can actually be quite life-changing if you let it. And I will tell you this, it's okay to be skeptical. I have people come in who are skeptical. I'm fine with that. Just please be open-minded. That makes the difference, but it's okay to say, well, how would you, you never met my mom. How would you know her, her first name was Judy? You're right. I don't. How would I know that? (laughs) You know what I mean? So being skeptical is fine, but be open-minded to what's going to come through for you. And, and really there's nothing to be worried about. There's not. I also would say there's an amazing website called find a certified medium. So even if you didn't choose to have a reading with me, I would say go to a medium that has been certified, that has been tested, that you know has some um, degree of legitimacy behind them and, and is able to bring through information that you'd be looking for. Okay, well, I'm going to encourage folks to reach out to you. First of all, you can tell from listening to Michelle that she is a sincere and lovely person. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't imagine you have a mean bone in your body um, or one that is set to harm anyone. So I, I feel totally comfortable. And, you know, so if someone's been wondering if they should reach out, check your heart, you're going to know, and reach out to Michelle or look for the certified medium And Michelle, can you just tell us where people should find you when you say you could reach out to me? Yeah, absolutely. My website is michelleclare, C-L-A-R-E dot net. And there's a lot of opportunities on there. So I I do one-on-one readings, but I also have online groups. I have in-person groups. I have a membership. So I'm really accessible in a lot of different ways. And, And I love that because I know that this is really about sharing the universe and sharing the love that God has for all of us. And, and really part of that is the fact that we didn't come from a God, a universe, a source that loves us so much to disconnect us from our loved ones. That connection truly is eternal and it's still happening now. It just looks a little different than it did when they were in a body. Thank you so much for being a guest, Michelle. Um, It's really been powerful for me, and I hope and I know that there's a listener out there who needed to hear your message today. Thank you so much for having me. It's truly been an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.